Welcome to Brainish English Stories. Once upon a time, some friends had a special dinner just for guys. They used to meet without their wives, like they did when they were not married. They ate a lot, drank a lot, and talked about everything. They brought up old happy memories that made them smile and feel warm inside. One of them said, Hey, George, remember when we went to Saint Germain with those two little girls from Montmartre? Oh, I remember. George replied. They recalled details, and it made them happy. They started talking about marriage. Each one honestly said, Oh, if we could go back and do it differently. George Duporton said, It's weird how it happens. You decide never to marry. Then, in spring, you go to the countryside. The weather is warm, the summer is beautiful, fields full of flowers, and then, boom! You meet a young girl at a friend's house, bam! You come back married. Peter said, Exactly. That's my story too, with some interesting twists. His friend interrupted, You have no complaints. You have the best wife, pretty and perfect. You're probably the happiest of us all. But Peter continued, It's not my fault. Why? I do have a perfect wife. But I didn't want to marry her at all. Nonsense. Yeah, here's what happened. I was 35 and had no plans to marry. I thought young girls were not interesting, and I loved having fun. In May, I got invited to my cousin Simon's wedding in Normandy. It was a typical Normandy wedding. We sat at the table at five in the evening, and by eleven, we were still eating. I was paired up with Miss Davina, a retired Colonel Dumoulin's daughter. She was young, blonde, like a soldier, nice and talkative. She took over my whole day, dragged me into the park, made me dance, and bored me to death. I thought, this is okay for today. But tomorrow I'll escape. That's final. Around eleven at night, the ladies went to their rooms, and the men stayed behind, smoking and drinking. We could see people from the countryside dancing through the open window. Farmers and girls were jumping in a circle, shouting loudly to music played by two violins and a clarinet. The peasants' energetic singing sometimes drown out the instruments, and the music, mixed with their loud voices, reached us in bits and pieces. There were two big barrels with drinks for everyone, surrounded by torches. Two men were busy cleaning glasses in a bucket and then holding them under the taps. The drinks flowed out red wine or golden cider. Thirsty dancers, the older ones calmly and the girls excitedly, came up, stretched their arms, and grabbed a drink. They threw their heads back and drank from whatever they preferred. On a table, there was bread, butter, cheese, and sausages. Everyone stepped up from time to time, took a bite, and under the starry sky, this healthy and lively activity looked nice. It made you want to drink from the big barrels and eat crispy bread and butter with a raw onion. I got a strong desire to join the fun, so I left my friends. I admit I was probably a bit tipsy, but soon I was completely drunk. I grabbed the hand of a big, tired peasant woman and danced with her until I was out of breath. Then I drank some wine and found another girl to dance with. To freshen up, 
I drank a bowl of cider and started bouncing around like I was possessed. I felt light on my feet. The boys were happy, watching and trying to copy me. All the girls wanted to dance with me. After each dance, I drank a glass of wine or cider. By around two in the morning, I was so drunk that standing up was a big challenge. I knew I was very drunk, and I tried to go to my room. The house was quiet and dark because everyone was asleep. I didn't have any matches, and everyone was already in bed. When I got to the entrance hall, I started feeling dizzy. It was hard to find the banister. Finally, by accident, my hand touched it, and I sat down on the first step of the stairs to try to clear my head. My room was on the second floor, the third door on the left. Luckily, I remembered that. With this knowledge, I got up, not without difficulty, and started going up step by step. I held onto the iron railing tightly to avoid falling and tried not to make any noise. My foot missed the steps three or four times, and I fell on my knees. But thanks to the strength of my arms and willpower, I avoided falling completely. Finally, I reached the second floor and started walking down the hall, feeling the walls. I found a door, counted, one. However, a sudden dizziness made me lose my grip on the wall, and I turned and fell against the other wall. I wanted to walk straight but the crossing was long and challenging. Eventually, I reached the end and, carefully, started walking again until I found another door. To be sure not to make a mistake, I counted out loud, too. I continued my walk. Finally, I found the third door. I said, three, that's my room, and turn the knob. The door opened. Despite my confused state, I thought, since the door opens, this must be home. After gently closing the door, I stepped into the darkness. I bumped into something soft, my easy chair. I immediately lay down on it. In my condition, it wouldn't have been smart to look for my dresser, candles, or matches. It would have taken me at least two hours. I might not have succeeded in undressing even then. So, I gave up. I only took off my shoes, unbuttoned my waistcoat, which was tight, loosened my trousers, and went to sleep. This surely lasted a long time. I was suddenly awakened by a deep voice saying, What, you lazy girl, still in bed? It's ten o'clock. A lady's voice said, Already? I was so tired yesterday. I was confused, wondering what this talk meant. Where was I? What did I do? My thoughts were all over the place, still surrounded by a heavy fog. The first voice said, I'm going to open your curtains. I heard steps coming toward me. Not knowing what to do, I sat up. Then a hand touched my head. I got startled. The voice asked, Who's there? I made sure not to answer. A furious grip grabbed me. I, in turn, grabbed him, and we had a big struggle. We were rolling around, knocking over furniture, and crashing into walls. A lady's voice was yelling, Help! Help! Servants, neighbors, scared women gathered around us. 
the blinds were open and the shades were drawn. I was in a struggle with Colonel Dumoulin. After we were separated, I ran to my room, shocked. I locked myself in and sat down with my feet on a chair because my shoes were left in the young girl's room. I heard a lot of noise throughout the house, doors opening and closing, whispers, and fast steps. After half an hour, someone knocked on my door. I shouted, Who's there? It was my uncle, the bridegroom's father. I opened the door. He was pale and furious, scolding me harshly. You have behaved like a scoundrel in my house, do you hear? Then he added more gently, But, you young fool, why did you let yourself get caught at ten o'clock in the morning? You go to sleep like a log in that room, instead of leaving immediately right away. I exclaimed, But, uncle, I assure you that nothing happened. I was drunk and got into the wrong room. He shrugged his shoulders. Don't talk nonsense. I raised my hand, saying, I swear to you on my honor. My uncle continued, Yes, that's all right. It's your duty to say that. I got angry and told him the whole unfortunate event. He looked at me with a confused expression, not knowing what to believe. Then he went out to talk with the colonel. I heard that a group of moms formed a kind of jury, and they talked about the different parts of what happened. He came back an hour later, sat down like a judge, and said, No matter what happened, I see only one solution for you, marry Miss Davina. I jumped out of the chair, shouting, Never! Never! Seriously, he asked, Well, what do you plan to do? I answered simply, Leave as soon as I get my shoes back. My uncle continued, Don't joke. The colonel has decided to harm you when he sees you. He's serious about it. I mentioned a duel, and he said, No, I'll harm him. Now, let's look at it differently. Either you behave badly, and then it's worse for you, one shouldn't go near a young girl. Or, being drunk, like you say, you made a mistake in the room. In that case, it's still bad for you. You shouldn't get into such silly situations. No matter what you say, the poor girl's reputation is ruined because people don't believe a drunk person's excuses. The only real victim here is the girl. Think about it. He left and I shouted after him, Say what you want, I won't marry her. I stayed alone for another hour. Then my aunt came. She was crying. She used every reason. No one believed my story. They couldn't imagine that this girl forgot to lock her door in a house full of people. The colonel hit her. She had been crying the whole morning. It was a terrible and unforgettable scandal. My good aunt said, ask for her hand, anyway. We might find a way out when we're making the papers. This made me feel better. I agreed to write my proposal. An hour later, I left for Paris. The next day I learned that they accepted me. Then, in three weeks, before I could find any excuse, they announced the wedding, sent out the news, signed the agreement, and one Monday morning, I found myself in a church next to a teary young girl. I told the magistrate that I agreed to have her as my partner, for better, for worse. 
I hadn't seen her since my adventure, and I looked at her from the corner of my eye with a bit of surprise. However, she wasn't ugly far from it. I thought, here's someone who won't laugh every day. She didn't look at me all day, and she didn't say a word. In the middle of the night, I went to the wedding room, planning to tell her my decisions because I was in charge now. I found her sitting in a chair, fully dressed, pale, and with red eyes. As soon as I entered, she stood up and came slowly toward me, saying, Sir, I am ready to do whatever you say. I will end my life if you want. The colonel's daughter looked as pretty as she could in this brave role. I kissed her, it was my right. Soon, I realized I hadn't made a bad deal. I've been married for five years now. I don't regret it at all. Peter was quiet. His friends were laughing. One of them said, Marriage is like a game of chance, you should never pick your numbers. The random ones are the best.